Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. Today, as I mentioned in the intro, I'm really excited to welcome Melissa Hartwig, founder of Whole30. I can't believe we haven't had you on the show, Melissa. Well, you and I have talked so often at events and behind the scenes, but yeah, I'm really excited to get an invite and chat with you formally. Yeah, I felt like the timing was perfect because as most of my listeners know, I just uh, released a book about, uh, among other things, the importance of diet, lifestyle, and behavior change in in preventing and reversing chronic disease and addressing the epidemic of chronic disease that we're suffering from. And of course, Melissa, this is something that's very close to your heart and something that you believe in and have practiced and preached for many, many years now with the Whole30 program. So as a way of of diving into this topic of how to change diet in particular in in a powerful way that can not only prevent disease, but even reverse it after it's already occurred. Why don't you just, uh, I think a lot of people who are listening to this, of course, have heard of Whole30, but for those that haven't, why don't you just talk a little bit about how this uh, originated? I think you have your own interesting story, and this came out of your own personal experience, I know. And then, you know, what the Whole30 is, and we'll go from there. Yeah, interesting is a very polite way to put it. (laughs) Um, A lot of times people will say, have you always been healthy? And my answer is no. My interest in health and fitness actually came as a result of crisis. As you know, crisis Mm -hmm. like often drives change. And I was a drug addict for about four or five years in college and then after and have been clean for almost 18 years now. But it was when I got out of rehab and realized that I had to change every aspect of my life in order to stay clean and kind of protect myself and build a buffer between me and kind of my like impulses and urges and addictions that I found health and fitness. And I got into it through CrossFit and running triathlon, you know, doing triathlons and started with like a body for lifestyle diet and then zone style diet and then discovered Rob Wolf and paleo. And so it all just sort of tripped along in my own personal growth and trying to become a healthy person with healthy habits. And the whole 30 was just another one of those self experiments. We had Mm -hmm. just gone to a Rob Wolf seminar where he was talking about these factors, dietary factors that can influence everything from, you know, digestion to chronic pain to energy to sleep to performance in the gym, which was really important to me. And at the end of the seminar, he said, you know, just try it for 30 days. And that's exactly what we did. We just said, okay, let's do this 30 day experiment where we pull out these dietary factors that are really commonly problematic. And the science bears this out. Let's pull them out and see what happens. And I wanted to see what would happen to my athletic performance. I wasn't overweight. I wasn't trying to change body composition. I just kind of was like, maybe I'll do better in the gym. Mm -hmm. And what that 30 day experiment highlighted for me was all of the ways in which my relationship with food and my habits around food were profoundly dysfunctional. And I don't think I ever would have become aware of it had I not stripped out the stuff that I was using for comfort and reward and sometimes punishment and to self-soothe and relieve anxiety. In the absence of those foods for 30 days, I was forced to both acknowledge the unhealthy way I was using them and find other ways to kind of comfort myself and reward myself and show myself love. And it was just such a powerful experience for me that I decided to share it on my blog. And that was July 2009. That was the start of the first official Whole30. (laughs) Cool. And since then, millions of people around the world have gone through it. And it's become a a fantastic entry point for for a lot of people. And not just an entry point, a refresh. You know, a, a lot of people do an approach like this when you know, if they started to slide a little bit over time, we all, we all know that happens. So it's not just a starting place. It's also something that we can, you know, people can come back to over and over to, you know, recommit basically. To- it's funny, you know, I really don't see having to repeat whole thirties as any sort of failure or right. like uh, moral failing or willpower failure, or that you're not really trying. What we're talking about is trying to reverse decades of less healthy habits, an unhealthy emotional connection to food, and all of the physiological effects that happen when we eat these modern, super normally stimulating, calorie-dense, nutrient-poor foods. You're not going to do that in 30 days. So I really love that people feel like they can come back and kind of get that reset, get that touchstone, that grounding, and then go on and kind of live their food freedom in between programs. 
Yeah, I mean, it's so uh, all major religions have or, or most have fasting or periods of fasting built into that. And I think it's interesting, you know, Whole30 is not a fasting program, but it is it has similar impact in the sense of highlighting our the unhealthy ways that we can relate to food and, and the roles that food play in our life that go way beyond just meeting nutrient needs, you know, that you that you just spoke to in, in your own experience. And it's a program like Whole30 is really interesting in that regard because it's it's not just about food and diet and the relationship between food and diet and physical, physiological health. It's also, uh, as you shared a lot about emotional and behavioral and psychological health too. As I, you know, it's about food, but it's not really about food. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. that's what people discover, I think, when they take on the program is they start out really paying attention to the technicalities and the yeah. food itself. And then they discover that there's really so much more to the mindset and the commitment and the, and the relationship. Right. It's, it becomes kind of a framework or a vehicle for all of these other very positive changes that people are making in their life. And perhaps most importantly, just raising their awareness about, cause, cause that's so much of what it's about, isn't it? It's like just a lot of people don't even think much about the way that food impacts their health. I mean, that, that sounds crazy for a lot of people who are listening to this show because most of your listeners and readers and mine uh, too do. But for a, we, we all know that a lot of people don't. Um, you know, I went on Joe Rogan's show recently and one of the interesting outcomes of that was, you know, a lot of hearing from a lot of people on Twitter that, you know, quite transparently and frankly just said, wow, I'd never really thought about this stuff before, you know, and and this is kind of blowing my mind. And for all of us, we tend to forget that, that the majority of people out there are not thinking about this. So, you know, Whole30 as a vehicle for raising people's awareness about, you know, the the relationship between their behavior and their health and their life and, and their diet and their lifestyle with their health is a major thing. Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head. You tell someone who has a horrible hacking cough that they should quit smoking and they go, <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, I make that connection. I probably should. You tell someone who suffers from migraines or chronic pain or an autoimmune condition that maybe the food they're putting on their plate is making their symptoms worse. And that is a much harder connection to draw until they have the personal experience. That's and right. that's really what the Whole30 is all about is giving them that personalized like self experiment to help them draw the connections for themselves. Right. Which is why Rob always emphasized, just try it. You know, don't, don't take my word for it. Just try it. Um, you know, do it. It's 30 days. Like there are a lot of other things that you do. You, people have done that are a lot harder than that. Like childbirth, for example. <laughs> <laughs> childbirth is harder. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes, so. That's one of the most famous lines in the whole 30. Yes. Right. Drinking your coffee black is not that hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it not only is a lack of awareness, there's actually can be pushback, which I'm sure you've, you've received too. But it, you know, I was, I talked on Joe Rogan about, uh, we actually watched a commercial about Humira, which is a drug that's used for autoimmune diseases like Crohn's and, you know, IBD. And we were talking about it in the context of how dangerous it can be. Now, certainly I didn't argue that it wasn't necessary in some situations and it can't be part of a recovery program, but it was amazing to see like some of the pushback on Twitter and in social media, like, you know, Humira is, how dare you assume that diet changes could treat Crohn's as effectively as Humira, you know, and because this is really built into our culture, this idea that, that these diseases uh, require drugs to treat them. And I think some people actually feel threatened or offended if you suggest that diet change could be part of the solution because Perhaps there is in that some feeling of personal guilt or responsibility. Whereas if you, if that's not possible and you just have to take a drug, there's there, you know, I don't have to look as carefully at at my own diet and behavior. Yes, that is such an interesting conversation. And it it's something I've come across in seminars where the people who are the most resistant to the idea are usually the people who are the sickest. Mm-hmm. I had a woman in a seminar once with MS who just, her husband really like encouraged her to go because he had heard some great testimonials and she was so resistant to the idea. And I think, and you would know working so closely with patients that like, 
if you change your diet and things get better, then that forces you to accept the fact that some of your behaviors contributed to the condition getting worse. And that is scary. That is yeah. responsibility. It's way easier to say, I have a disease. It was foisted upon me. There's nothing I can do. And I'm relying on these medical experts and these, you know, pharmaceuticals to treat me. It's kind of two sides of the same coin. If you can use food to get better, then that means that what you were doing perhaps contributed to you feeling poorly. And that's hard that's to accept right. for a lot of people. That's right. It's hard to accept because I think what happens there is that gets unfortunately tied up with guilt rather than just res responsibility. And I understand responsibility to mean ability to respond. <laughs> you know, I have the ability to respond to this, not I'm to blame. And, and that, that blame and, sh and shame, I think, that comes with that and guilt becomes a major obstacle. And so the way I like to talk about that with patients or people is, is just to say, you know, is to split those apart. Like you can become aware of your responsibility without accepting or taking on blame or guilt or shame. You know, just the recognition that, yes, you know, unknowingly you made choices around diet that, by the way, hundreds of millions or billions of other people are making every day because it's just, it's just part of our culture. You know, it's the way that we were brought up to it's not your fault in the same way that the way that you were parented and, and how you were born and how you were raised as a kid is not your fault. So let's like, let's actually recognize the contribution that your choices have made without you taking on that whole story of blame. Because I think that's what becomes the obstacle for people actually taking responsibility and getting past that. Can you imagine if every healthcare practitioner had that conversation with their patients? Can you imagine how much better people would get? Like, I've not heard a doctor or a healthcare practitioner outside of kind of our community address a, a health condition or even food in that manner. And there's so much guilt and shame and morality attached to food and what we eat and the effects it has on our body and like, that's the conversation we need to be having. Yeah, it's, I love it's, it. It's definitely very much the conversation that we need to be having and why I'm, and, and, you know, frankly, it may not be a conversation that people have with their doctor very often. It's probably going to be a conversation that they have with their health coach or their nutritionist, which is why I'm such a believer that we need more of that kind of work in our, in our approach to chronic disease because doctors just, they just may not be the ones to have that conversation. But you know, going back to the Humira example, aside from what we just said, which I think is the most important piece, the other piece that I pointed out in my response is um, actually we do have proof that diet can be as effective as Humira and steroids, or at least play a big role. And I, you're probably aware of the study <clears throat> that was recently published at UCSD on AIP, which is the first peer-reviewed study on AIP showing that it was remarkably effective in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So I was, ex I mean, Whole30 is not AIP. AIP is a little bit more restrictive and more specific, but this is, it's this very similar approach and it's objective peer reviewed evidence showing that this isn't just in our heads. It actually can reverse disease, even the most serious, you know, some of the most serious diseases. Yes. And it's, you know, you can say perhaps all day long, like I've got eight years and thousands of pieces of clinical evidence to show the exact same thing. But it's really nice to have a paper to back it Absolutely. up. Absolutely, <laughs> Yeah, it's an important part of our framework for, you know, and, and so the anecdotal experience, I think, is crucial and shouldn't be discounted just because it's not in a peer reviewed journal. But at the same time, it's not enough to lead to widespread adoption within the, you know, conventional medicine community, if that's what we're, that we're hoping for. And I'm not somebody who gets too hung up on that. I think change is going to happen in a lot of different ways, but certainly having a study to point to is helpful. It is. It's huge. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, you've been doing this for a while now, 2009, here we are in 2017. So almost a decade later, I'm sure you've, you've learned a bit about Whole30 and how to make it effective and what works and doesn't work. And, you know, I know that that's partly why you wrote two new books, which we're going to be talking about shortly. But why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, what you have learned over that period of time? Yeah. You know, the program itself, the, the rules, the structure, the foods you eliminate, the foods that you eat, 
haven't changed that much in the last eight years. We've added a few things back in because they were originally eliminated just because we were being super dogmatic about it, like white potatoes. And we've eliminated, kind of made a few rule tweaks because today's convenience and modern foods in the quote, paleo realm are way different than they looked like even four or five years ago, right? There are a Mm -hmm. lot more kind of paleo like treats and, and convenience foods and chips and all this other stuff. So we've had to kind of address that, but the rules themselves haven't changed. What has changed dramatically is my voice in the program. Hmm. And I think my understanding of how people need to be supported. So when we started in 2009, our primary audience was CrossFit. I was very involved in the CrossFit community. I was traveling, coaching kettlebells. I was writing for the CrossFit Journal. And you tell a group of CrossFitters like, hey, here's your thing for 30 days. It's going to be hard, but you need to like suck it up and do it. It's going to be good for you. And they're on board. (laughs) They don't need anything else. You tell them it's going to be hard and they're like, sweet, roll up their sleeves. Right. When they started sending their moms, and I remember Mm -hmm. exactly when this happened. It was a January seminar, January 2013 in Philadelphia. And I remember looking out over our nutrition seminar audience and I was like, there are a lot of like, 50, 60 year olds in our crowd. This is different. And it was people who said my nephew told me I had to come or my daughter brought me here or I read about, you know, I knew someone who did it and, and they told me I should come listen. And that's really when like the tone and the voice changed. I began to realize that people need so much more support than I had imagined that this is a very scary proposition, changing your diet and your relationship with food. And there's still a place, you know, Whole30 is very famous for our tough love. And there is still a time and a place for that. But I wield it very carefully and I wield it very heavily on the love side. Um, mm-hmm. So there's a little bit of tough and a little bit of and I'm hoping people find that inspiring and motivating. But my job for the last four years has been what can I do to support you? What do you need? What resource can I create? What video can I make? What article can I write? What book can I bring to life? Like, what do you need to feel like you are supported in every aspect of this program? The, the physical, the emotional, the psychological, the spiritual, like, what can I give you? I think that's really wise. Um, you know, as a clinician who, of course, has worked with, you know, thousands of patients at this point, everyone's approach to behavior change is different. And as you pointed out, you know, most of us, and, and myself included, you know, my patients, especially initially, were, were the people who were the most motivated, the sickest, had, had tried everything, and you know I was their sort of final hope. And those patients are willing to, to do anything, <laughs> and and they will comply with every recommendation that I make. And you know, working with that population is really rewarding and and easy in some ways because the compliance doesn't become an issue. Later, as my practice grew and we hired more clinicians and you know, more people learned about my work and we got the same issue, like the moms and the cousins and, you know, people who were not as connected to the work and not, and, and frankly, not as sick and not as, you know, not as motivated to make the changes. I had to start reevaluating how I approach things. And, you know, part of what we did was we brought on a health coach who, you know, we're, is getting training in, in behavior change and things like motivational interviewing and positive psychology and, because we came to realize that for the general population, just telling people what to do is not going to be very effective. <laughs> There's a saying, a guy, uh, Bruce Fortis, I think, was at University of Washington, and he said, he has a quote that I like, uh, patient education is to behavior change as spaghetti is to a brick wall. <laughs> So, which I try to keep in mind, the CrossFitters and the hardcore, you know, uh, chronic illness community and paleo folks who are super motivated, yeah, they can do it. But for the others, they they need a little bit more handholding and support. So I think that's uh, really smart, and it's it's clear that that came out of your your own experience working with people. It did, and you know, my gosh, there's so much of my background between my own addiction and recovery, between the area, my real area of interest and research, especially for a few of the more recent books I've written have been behavior change, psychology of change, habit, willpower. And those are real, you know, big interests. There have been a few tools that have come out lately. Gretchen Rubin's Four Tendencies is like a game changer in terms of me figuring out how to talk to whole 30 years. You know, you, you have to say the same, you know, with your patients, you have to say the same thing 
six different ways until you find the way that clicks for them. Yeah. And you have to be willing to flex your conversation style and your personality and take your ego out of it to get the message across. And, uh, you know, I think uh, you ask kind of what's changed over the last few years. I think of many years ago, I used to say, this is just my style. You know, I'm a little tough love. I'm a little hardcore. And like, if it offends you or you don't get it, then like, that's your problem. And guess what? That's not your problem. That's my problem because mm -hmm. my job is to inspire change. And if I am not doing that in a large section of my population, I need to figure out how to flex my personality and my communication style and my intentions to get my message across. Otherwise, I'm just shooting myself in the foot. And so that was a, a lesson I learned the hard way a few times. And I'm much, much better with that now. Great. Yeah. And that's an important one. And it's not just even I would say their problem or your problem or my problem as a practitioner, it's actually all of our problem because if we don't reverse this epidemic of chronic disease, it doesn't just have personal individual consequences. You know, it's not just about my health, it's not going to get better or your health, it's not going to get better. It's about our kids living shorter lifespans than we are. It's about our country actually getting becoming bankrupt because it can't pay for the burden of chronic disease. I mean, it, I don't actually even think it's an exaggeration to say that it's about the survival of our species, at least in its as we currently <laughs> understand it. So these are these are you know things that we're taking on that are much bigger than ourselves as individuals, and even much bigger than our communities that that we talk about. It's really I've come to see this as like a a significant threat to human existence, and certainly human our ability to thrive as a species. Yeah. I agree with you. I do. And gosh, the way that we do that is just like one person at a time or yeah. hopefully, you know, a thousand people or a million people who read the books and, and buy into the program. But yeah, it, it can, I guess, feel a little overwhelming when you think about it like that. But then when you think about how much headway you can make just by con really connecting with people, whether that's one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one or your online community or at an event that you're attending, like really connecting in a way that is like open and authentic and vulnerable and having those tough conversations that you mentioned about the guilt and the shame. And like, I think that's how I envision kind of inspiring change. Absolutely. And this is why I've become a passionate believer in health coaching and why I think it really will be a, a huge part of this movement to reinvent healthcare. Because, you know, the average visit with a primary care provider today is, is between eight and 12 minutes. There is not enough time for that conversation <laughs> that we're referring to in that 12 minute visit. And certainly we can take steps to try to lengthen those visits. And I, I advocate that for that in the book. But if you have a health coach that's tr that's trained in in how to establish trust and rapport, you know how to build a strong relationship with their client. If they're trained in motivational interviewing, which is helping people to discover their own motivation for change instead of just you know telling them why they should change, which does you know I, all we have to do is think about our own experience of, of people telling us what to do and you know remembering how we reacted to that to see how effect effective that is. <laughs> And then, you know, evidence-based principles of behavior change, which, of course, Gretchen talks about in her book, and there are many other books about, you know, uh, shrinking the change and, and you know, st the importance of tools and technology and other resources that we can make available that, that actually support people in making change, which we're going to talk about very shortly in, in your new book. There's so many things we can do, you know, can provide to people to enable them and support them in making the change. And so it's, it's just awesome to hear that you have moved in this direction because I, I think your impact is going to be you know, that much more effective. It's already been enormous, but it's just going to become even more, you know, you're going to reach so many more people with this approach. Yeah, thank you. I think one of the things we learned really early on was that you cannot win an emotional argument with logic. Yeah, especially on the internet. Yep. So I think that's been a guiding principle of our approach for many years now. Yeah, great. So let's let's use that as a segue to talk about your new books. You have one book which really does seem like it's arisen out of this, you know, exactly out of this conversation that we've been having. Like, how do you provide people with more support? And the equivalent of handholding uh, that you know that you can do in a book and a, in a virtual kind of setting, and then you know how do you actually make it 
possible. You know, people are busy. That's the, that's something that there's no disagreement on, and so they don't necessarily have four hours to spend in the kitchen preparing all all of their meals. And it's not not easy to eat out with Whole Thirty. So how do you, how do they actually quickly figure out some meals that they can put together that turn this from like, oh my god, how am I going to ever do this? To oh, I could actually probably pull this off. Yeah. Exactly. Whole 30 day by day, which is kind of a 30 day guide to your whole 30. The the general idea came out in an email service that we released in 2012, where everyone who signed up for the email service got an email every day of their whole 30 full of some motivation and some support and some tips. And and it was wildly successful. And that was born from habit research that showed that the more closely connected people stay to the process and the more accountability they have, the better chance they have of sticking with a new habit long-term. And there's some built-in accountability at the bottom of every email. You are expected to check a button that says either I did it, I stuck to my whole 30 today, or I went off plan and I need to start over. And Mm -hmm. for a lot of people, knowing that that accountability is there is a real motivator to kind of push through some more difficult times in addition to all the other support we offer. And so the thing that that program was missing, though, was like a journaling or a reflection component. And right. obviously, the idea of writing down goals, writing down progress, um, staying connected to your growth mindset by kind of journaling or reflecting or writing is a very important piece. And that's where the idea for Day by Day came from. It's I've been researching it for a few years now. After having watched thousands of people go through the program I can basically tell you where you are on any given day with eerie accuracy. And obviously there's discrepancy. Everybody's program looks a little different. But generally speaking, like if you're on day 10, I know how you're feeling. And I can tell you what you need to kind of get through like what we call one of the hardest days. And all of that went into day by day. So there's a timeline, what to expect on this day. There's Melissa's motivation where I'm basically like, perched on the side of your bed, speaking directly to you every morning to kind of get you like off and running for your day. There's a habit hack, there's a tip, there's an FAQ, there's some community inspiration. And then there's a few pages of guided reflection. And at the end of every day, there's a box you have to check that said, I did it. Whole 30 day 10 is in the bag. Nice. Yeah. I'm a big nerd when it comes to learning theory. I studied a lot of learning theory and behavior change theory before I created my ADAPT clinician training program. And one of the things that I learned that I know you're aware of based on how you design this is that taking action on something that we've learned is one of the best ways to solidify that learning and, and make it practical in your life. So whether you know writing something down in a journal or reflecting on it or you know, actually going and doing the pantry clean out, these, these kinds of steps instead of just reading the book. I mean, it's so, so easy for us, and I'm sure we've all done this, to just read the book. Oh, that's interesting. That's nice. <laughs> then you set, put the book on the bookshelf and that's it. I mean, it's not actually going to change your behavior. But if you are taking action on it by journaling, reflecting, or, you know, carrying out uh, recommended steps in bite-sized pieces, which this, this program has always been structured in that way, it's so you're so much more likely to succeed, and this has been proven over and over again in the research literature on behavior change, which is extensive. I think a lot of people are surprised to find this out. We're not just making this stuff up. There's there's actually a lot of research and evidence that go that goes into successful behavior change, and and I uh, it sounds like that's really been part of your journey in in terms of writing this book. Yeah, it has been, and I find it super fascinating because obviously with my personal experience with addiction and recovery, and Mm -hmm. a lot of the habit research is done on people who are trying to quit smoking or quit drinking or quit drugs, which is, you know, I've always said from a psychological perspective in terms of the kind of cycle and the emotional state it puts us in and the guilt and the shame and the overconsumption, like drugs and food are not necessarily that different. So yeah, I, I really enjoy reading that stuff and I enjoy you know, reading a book and hearing a theory and thinking, how can I apply this to my whole 30 years? Okay, we'll put a little box at the end to check or we'll include extra credit every day, something that you can do to help you prep for the next day so that you wake up feeling like you have a plan because the brain really likes a plan. And so, yeah, yeah, I kind of geek out on that stuff too. (laughs) Cool. Yeah, I can see that. And it's, it's necessary. I mean, if you're really serious about behavior change, which you are, you have to consider this stuff. It's, it's not, 
And you learn that the hard way, I think, in your in the past of, like you said, your story about how just saying this is my style and if you don't like it, hit the road. And sure, that that works, but, but it will mean you'll only be effective in reaching a certain number of people who share that, who respond well to that style. And they're definitely out there. But I know your goal is to reach a much bigger audience, and this is this is how you're doing it. So the the second book is the whole thirty fast and easy cookbook. You have 150 delicious everyday recipes, which I think every day is important in there because you know. If you're having a dinner party, that's one thing. You've got a few hours maybe to be in the kitchen and take, you know, listen to some music and prepare the food. But for most people, every day means, oh my God, I just got home from work. I pick up the kids and then I got to get to the store and get back home and get dinner on the table in like an hour. <laughs> All of that, you know. So tell us about this. So that's another way that my thought process has evolved is over the last few years, I've been a huge fan of the idea of letting good enough be good enough. Not every Whole30 meal needs to be an Instagram-worthy religious experience where you've hand-harvested your own kale under a hunter's moon and roasted it in unicorn fat. Like sometimes, and I'm going to give this as an example, last night's dinner was cold leftover roasted butternut squash eaten straight out of the glass serving container with, I did use a fork, um, and a couple Applegate Farms hot dogs with some mustard. And I think there was some like sautéed spinach in there somewhere, but like, That was my dinner because I had a really richly scheduled day and I was doing meal prep at the same time. Is it ideal? Is it the most nourishing? Is it, you know, the most lovingly prepared? No, but man, was it good enough? Absolutely. Um, And and that's what Fast and Easy is all about. It's ways for you to get breakfast, lunch, and dinner on the table in a way that is satisfying, in a way that doesn't sacrifice flavor, but, you know, that doesn't keep you stuck in what we call good food jail. We want you to be enjoying the benefits of your Whole30, not stuck in the kitchen all the time. And we've pulled about 10 contributors from the Whole30 community to share some of their favorite recipes too. So yeah, that that was a cookbook I was really excited about. Cool. Yeah. I mean, having good recipes that you like and are easy to prepare, you can't, I mean, you can't underestimate the importance of that and impact of that. It can really make the difference between somebody doing it and not doing it. Because if they, if they look through the book and they're like, there's no way I could ever pull these off. I'm not very experienced with cooking or I just don't have time to do that. They're probably not even going to consider doing the program. Exactly. And again, the, we're really focused on accessibility right now. So it only uses ingredients that you can find at any old grocery store. You don't need a super specialty food store. You don't need a super specialty like list of kitchen gadgets. Uh, you know, a slow cooker is one of the least yeah. expensive and most transformative appliances I think you game can have changer. in your kitchen. Total game changer. Yeah. So, you know, it's just all about, again, reaching as broad an audience as possible and showing them like, this is what, this is what Whole30 looks like. Sometimes it's Applegate Farms hot dogs and cold leftover butternut squash. And like, but I stayed, I stuck to my commitment and I didn't That's order right. pizza. That's and right. I didn't have popcorn and wine for dinner. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's super important even to know how, like, I think a lot of people, you know, part of this is just getting more familiar with these different kinds of foods and different ways of putting them th- together that are simple and satisfying because somebody might not even think of that because they've never gone to a restaurant and ordered that, you know, on the menu uh, or their mom never did that. And so they, they don't even actually consider putting those things together. And that's the, again, the value of having recipes. It's not just the recipes themselves, I find, in terms of you know, the, following the specific recipe, but recipes can also just give you ideas and be like, oh, wow, I see how they put those things together. So I could just do that and put those things together. You know, for me, at least, that's often how I use recipes. I don't necessarily even follow them by the letter. I just use them as uh, inspiration. That's exactly what I do. I have kind of like templates. So mm-hmm. like ground meat with stuff over stuff. And right. it's like, okay, do I have ground beef or ground chicken? Who cares? What veggies right. do I have in my fridge? I'm just going to saute them. What can I stick it on? Do I have zucchini noodles? Do I have some steamed spinach? Do I have butternut squash? Like, yeah, it's just a template. And then people can get creative. It's a way to use leftovers, which saves money and shopping time. And it can kind of, it's almost like the Bill Gates turtleneck and jeans of eating healthy. Like, just keep it simple <laughs> and just right. swap stuff out, right? And then yeah. it's one less thing you have to think about. Absolutely. The template approach is awesome. That's definitely how we do it around here. And and it's an important way, I think, for people to make use of what they have and not have to prepare something from scratch every time. And now we know, you know, there's certain foods that it's actually 
in some ways might be beneficial to eat leftover because they form different types of starches and you know so leftovers can get a bad rap but they actually can be a really useful part of the overall approach yeah see that's an added benefit for me but i'm just going to eat them because they're in my fridge and it means i don't have to cook one more time <laughs> exactly <laughs> also yeah. was it steve? i think it was steve jobs who wore the turtleneck and jeans it was steve jobs okay. no but <laughs> A lot of the most effective people, Barack Obama was pretty famous for only wearing a couple suits, and he actually spoke about it. He said, you know, he talked about decision fatigue, which is a well, you know, well-known reality that we only have a certain amount of mental energy to make decisions. And if you spend it all on like, what shoes am I going to wear and what clothes to wear, then you have less left over. And I, in the context of food, I think you know, just having some cookbooks around that you can quickly look at to give you some ideas is another way of dealing with that decision fatigue. It just makes it easier. I totally agree. And like, you don't have to eat the exact same meal every single day, but if you've got a template and you're swapping out veggies and fruit based on what's in season or what you happen to have on hand or what was at the farmer's market, that's like an automatic good balancing of micronutrients too. That's right. And you know what? Even if you do eat the same meal or close to the same meal for a few times in a row it's not the end of the world and that I'll, I'll give you a little secret that that's actually one of my most powerful advanced weight loss strategies with patients it uh, is it is because okay, tell me all right so you you know i think of the concept of food reward because you mentioned it earlier and variety is one of the key characteristics that drives reward value so the, you know, the easiest way to think about that is you, know, you, probably, you might have heard Rob Wolf tell the story of the guy who won, you know, won the ice cream eating competition. Have you heard this? No. Okay, so you can see it on YouTube. Rob will send you the link if you ping him. So this guy's you know, in an ice cream eating competition, and he, you can watch it on YouTube, and he's, it's like literally a kitchen sink full of ice cream. It's the most disgusting thing in the world. I don't know why you would enter this. But he's eating, and he's making progress. He's about 70% of the way through. And you can see him like visibly start to turn green and looks like he's going to vomit, and he's slowing down. He can't do it. And the way that he is able to finish is by ordering French fries, and eating the French fries. And most people, when they hear this, they're like, what? That doesn't make any sense. No, I get it. Yeah, you get it. Because it's a, the, the salty, crispy, totally different texture and flavor of that food provided enough variety for him to then go back and eat more of the sweet ice cream. And so if, you, if a patient you know, is having trouble losing weight, one of the strategies I'll have them do is just eat the same meal for two or three days in a row because... There's no variety there and you're eating the same thing over and over. And what will happen is you'll only eat exactly what you need to meet your nutrition needs. There's no, it's far, far less likely that any, you know, overeating will happen when you're eating the same foods over and over again. I like that tip so much. And I'm actually thinking about it from a perspective of breaking the dessert habit for people, because I have so many people who say, I feel like my meal is not complete until I have something sweet. And very often it's because your dinner was kind of savory. And then you want that offset either texture or flavor. It's something crunchy. It's something a little bit sweet, maybe a little salty. So I actually think that would be a great strategy for breaking that habit too. Yeah. I mean, and it's like the easiest, the way I explain this to people too, is like if you think of two plates and one has a baked potato with no fat or salt and the other has potato chips, you know, which do you think is easier to overeat? Yeah, it's obvious. I mean, everyone, nobody gets that wrong. With the potato, you'll eat as much as you need to satisfy your hunger, but no more. And with the potato chips, you'll, if you're like most people, you just keep eating until they're gone. Or, you know. And the reason for that is the variety. And it's, trigger, it's triggering all the mechanisms, salty, crunchy, fat. You know, it's triggering all those reward circuits in our brain. So, you know, these are these are not necessary for many people. Many people just doing whole thirty or something like that is enough to lose weight. But I just bring it up in the context of, you know, we were talking about leftovers and eating similar meals. Like, you know, yeah, it's interesting, and I, I believe we should enjoy food as much as we can. At the same time, there's no rule that says that we can't eat the same foods over, you know, a, a same meal twice in a row if we're busy and we have other things that are more important. Yeah, I mean, totally. And that's, again, it goes back to the idea of letting good enough be good enough, right? Yeah, if you're, I, I mean, one of my strategies for keeping, sticking to your healthy eating commitment on the Whole30 or in your food freedom is to cook double what you normally would and just eat oh. the same 
thing for breakfast the next morning or lunch the next day. And maybe you remix it a little bit by putting a different side dish on it or putting it over a salad. But yeah, these are like life-saving strategies for people who want to make eating real food in our busy modern world actually work. Totally. I agree a hundred percent. So I think by the time this show comes out, your book will, your books will already be available. So tell us where people can find these books. Yes, every they'll be out December 5th. So yes, um, and they're available anywhere books are sold. So we've got big support from Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Target and Costco and Indigo in Canada and Books A Million and they'll uh, be available via ebook. So yeah, your support your local bookstore or order online. Uh, I'll be doing an event in Los Angeles the night of December 5th when the books come out and then oh. I'll be doing a big book tour through the month of January. All right. So you'll need to, you'll need to have some quick and easy uh, recipes yourself during that period. I sure will. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Check out these books. We have the Whole Thirty Day by Day, your daily guide to Whole Thirty Success, and the Whole Thirty Fast and Easy Cookbook: 150 Simply Delicious Everyday Recipes for Your Whole Thirty. Melissa has been a powerful force for change in this movement for almost a decade now with the Whole30 program and millions of people around the world have been super successful. I mean, I have tons of patients who come to me who have you know, started on this path with, with the Whole30. And so it's, it's, a, it's really such a great service that you've been providing, Melissa. And I know these new books will help people, uh, even people who are experienced and who've already done it, to just make it that much easier and you know, more effective to do. Thank you so much, especially coming from you. That means a lot. I appreciate it. My pleasure. So I'll probably see you as we often are our, our once a year annual in-person sighting at Paleo FX next year. I know exactly, but it would be nice if it were more than once a year. So <laughs> yeah. maybe somehow we'll figure that out. But um, yeah, and wish you the best with the book launches. I know how, how challenging that can be in terms of, of your time. Thank you so much, and, and uh, congratulations on unconventional medicine. I'm looking forward to sharing that with both my whole, new Whole30 certified coaches because I've got a lot of MDs and NDs, hey. and I think they'll really love it, but also just my um, community in general. I think your voice is really missing in terms of big care, big kind of traditional healthcare practitioners, and I know that they will feel very reassured knowing that there's someone out there who will actually speak to them at that level. Great. Well, I appreciate that and look forward to seeing you soon whenever, whenever that is. Sounds good. Thanks, you All too. Right. Thanks, Melissa. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.